Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Texas is proud to partner with the Texas Tribune to provide free public events like the one you're about to see. These candid conversations are designed to promote public dialogue and civic engagement throughout the state. Thank you. Thank you. Nice, nice to see you. Nice to be on your home turf. Uh, yep. in, in deference to the veteran member, Representative Smithy, Chairman, let me let me start with you and ask you about the state of our state. If this were an odd number year, Governor Perry or whoever was serving as governor at the time would make a formal address telling us about the state of the state. It's an even number year, so I'm left wondering how we're doing, and I'm hoping that you can tell us how, how are things going in the state of Texas. Well, I think we're doing very well. I think when you compare the economy and the state of Texas right now, yeah. uh, we look a lot better than most other states. In fact, it's hard to imagine any other state that, that has the diversity and the strength that we have right now from an economic and job standpoint. Yeah. I think we've been a big beneficiary in the state of, of the recent explosion in, in gas and oil production, particularly in the Permian Basin uh, and in the, the uh, uh, down in South Texas, but to a large extent in the eastern and western Panhandle as well. We're, we're uh, right where we are now. We're, we're getting good and, and good new production on both sides of us, east and west. Yeah, that's been a big part of it. But it's much more diverse than that. And uh, you know, you look at Washington, uh, the federal government. You look at, at California, and you see these massive deficits. You know, we we balance budget in the state of Texas. We have no. Uh, no deficit, no right. deficit spending. And uh, we have this uh, reserve fund out there that, uh, you know, it has uh, multi-billions of dollars in it right now and is growing every day. Right. And so I, I think we have to say we're doing a lot of things right, but you still look at the horizon and you see the, four, the, the three big issues out there, education, water, and transportation. And you see a lot more questions right now than you see answers. Well, we're going to come to those, and I hope that you'll at least talk extensively about that. Senator Seliger, what uh, uh, Chairman Smithy uh, is talking about, undeniable. We weathered the recession better than any other state. We've created more jobs since 2000 than the other 49 states combined. By every economic measure, we're doing great. We're also adding, and we like to brag about it, 1,000 people to the state a day. People want to come here. They're voting with their feet. But they're not bringing public education. They're not bringing water, they're not bringing health care, and they're not bringing asphalt. So at some point, you wonder whether we're a victim of our own success. We have been successful, as Chairman Smithy says, Chairman Seliger, but at the same time, we are strained in terms of our resources. What do we do about that? That's why I think probably we should not fixate too much on the state of Texas today, but the state of the future of Texas. Yeah. How are we positioned to address the issues that clearly are going to face us? Yeah. A state that grows by 400,000 people a year, and, and certain members of that cohort are going to have to access the health care system, the criminal yeah. justice system, mental health system, and things like that. What are we going to do about water for the future? Even in, in areas where there are potential water deficits, like the Texas Panhandle, we have water supplies for the next generation two or three, but you have to look at a state in terms past those generations. What about a century from now and a century from then? Yeah. We want to see livability and sustainability all over the state of Texas. Uh, we are in position to address a lot of those issues, but we're going to have to work very, very hard at it because the issues are many, very diverse. The solutions are just a, as diverse. And a lot of them are going to cost money. Are you optimistic, Chairman, about our ability to solve those problems? I am always optimistic about well-meaning people when they have as many resources, human and otherwise, right. as we have in the state of Texas to address those problems. And, and yet, Representative Price, the, the, the tension that you're hearing, I think, is legitimate. On the one hand, a worldview that says we don't have a revenue problem in the state of Texas. We have a spending problem. We need to live within our means constitutionally. On the other hand, we don't have a spending problem. We have a failure to invest in the future. These really seem to be the competing tensions. And in your party and in the legislature today, there seems not to be an enormous appetite for finding lots of additional revenue and spending lots of additional money. So what do we do about that? Well, I think part of the analysis has to be separating wants from needs. Yeah. We have to make sure that as we analyze our, our infrastructure demands, you know, the population growing so quickly, state demographers estimating that the population of the state will double in the next 40 years. So, you know, right now we're a little over 26 million. We could have an excess of 50 million people by the right. year 2050. 
And as that, you know, uh, puts stresses on our transportation system, on our health care system, on our public education system, on our criminal justice system, I mean, you, you can't really provide essential government services without uh, recognizing there's, there's some increased demand there. So I think what we need to do is separate the wants from the needs, provide essential government services, don't raise taxes just to throw money at a problem. Right. Uh, what we need to do is prioritize, and, and we've done a good job of that. I think we've, we've had some, some tough challenges you know, two sessions ago when we had a, a shortfall entering this session. That was a very different environment than it was in the past session yeah. when we entered with a surplus. So I think we have to separate our wants from our needs and make priorities and, and move forward in that fashion. Ch Chairman, I want to get right into this, if that's okay. Let's just dive in. There's, there's physical infrastructure and there's social infrastructure. I'm hearing basically two buckets of, of needs. Um, on water and transportation, if you believe the experts who come and testify before all of you at, at committees, the state water plan was a $53 billion plan as proposed 50 years. Transportation, the numbers vary more. I'm going to go conservative and say a $270 billion need over 20 years to maintain the current roads we have at the current level of congestion. Chairman Williams re will remember that numbers have been higher, quoted higher in terms of the need. Uh, the money available to pay for those things is not going to come easy. You all found a way to get some money out of the rainy day fund with the support of the voters on water, hoping that that will happen on transportation. But it's really, relatively speaking, a drop in the bucket. When you're looking at challenges this large, water and transportation, just to basically keep pace, where are you going to get that money from? Well, uh, I think one of the things that, that the legislature has done wrong in the time that, that I've been there, and probably some before that, yeah. uh, is you look at our highway system, we have, we have neglected our highway system. And so by several years of neglect, now you have this big bill at the end. Yep. Uh, the same is true with water. We basically uh, pretended we didn't have a water issue in Texas for several years, and now we've got a problem, uh, a fairly pressing problem. I think the, the key going forward is to try to, to, uh, to pay as much of these costs each year as we can to, to keep up with the problem yep. instead of putting it off till tomorrow. I think that's the better way to manage it. Uh, but it, it will require money. Uh, now, uh, I think, and, but it's manageable. It's manageable if you do it on, on a, on a bi biannual basis yep. where, where you keep track of everything, keep it going as you go along. We're going to have a hard time raising taxes, taxes significantly. Well, you're not for taxes. You're no, not for no. new taxes. You're not for new taxes. You're not for new taxes. So let's just take that, yeah. you three take that off the table. Okay. So then where, where else do we go? Uh, well, if you, if you, you know, there's, there's two ways that, re as we know, revenue goes up. One is a tax rate increase, and one is, you know, our, our tax revenue goes up every, every time, you know, sales goes, go up yeah. in a given month. So we're, we're going to see growth uh, if the economy continues to, to perform well. Uh, we're just going to have to do what we do. We're going to have to do it smarter, uh, more efficiently. Yeah. Uh, there's hardly any area of state government right now that, that, you, that you could go to the people that are involved in that. In higher education, you could go to, to yeah. health services, highways, talk to the people involved day to day, and they couldn't tell you ways to make what we do more efficient and effective. That's always the case in yeah. government, because government's just by nature ineffective and inefficient. It has to be, you have to constantly right. be on top of it. Chairman, if you're talking about taking money every biennium out of the budget to pay for these problems, I'm thinking about what happened in 2013. You all had the opportunity potentially to take money out of general revenue toward water and transportation, but that money was hard to come by. It would have required pretty significant cuts. I mean, together you're talking about more than $4 billion between water and transportation that would have had to come out of general revenue as opposed to the rainy day fund. Unless you're prepared to say what you would have cut, or what you would cut going forward, how are you going to even find a couple billion dollars every two years out of a budget where dollars are really hard to come by? Well, I think one place you could start is, uh, and this is just an idea, it's, it's, there, there are other ideas, but, yeah. but one is just go in across the board, maybe a one, one and a half, two percent cut, you know, out of a 200 billion dollar budget in a, in a biennium, you know, that, that's a significant amount. Just of give money. everybody a haircut. Uh, you can do that. Yeah. Uh, on the other hand, it, when you have a good growth year, you know, you have eight or nine percent growth in revenue in a year, you could, you could dedicate a portion of, of that growth uh, to the infrastructure needs that you have. So yeah. it's, it's manageable and it's doable. Uh, how you get to that, to that point with yeah. a political solution, because you've got obviously a lot of different competing opinions, yeah. and uh, that's, that's the hard part. 
Representative Price, you know, we, we have witnessed over the last couple of years Governor Perry, God bless him, running around the country to pickpocket businesses from the other 49 governors. He goes to these uh, states like Connecticut and New York and California, and he says, we have low taxes, we have predictable regulation, we have tort reform, and of course, we have the magnificence of Texas. Relocate your business, relocate your employees, and come here. And that's been successful. But lately, even he would tell you that many of these businesses are saying, we'd love to come, but are you going to have enough water? Are you going to have enough transportation? Chairman Smithy is talking about growing the economy as a way to produce more revenue, undeniable. But don't we run into an economic development challenge if we have a hard time growing the economy precisely because our infrastructure problems or challenges are as great as they are? Well, it certainly presents a challenge. There's no question that we, we've got to recognize that. But we took a step in the right direction in this past session with the passage of HB4 and ultimately the Pap Proposition 6 passage. That was significant because other states were making that argument as yeah. the governor crisscrossed the country and businesses were enticed to move to Texas. Some started to recognize, well, they may not have a sustainable water supply or a sustainable source of financing to develop their water supply. Right. And so I think we've addressed that. And, you know, to be honest, in the, after the 82nd uh, legislative session, uh, there was a lot of dispute. And, and I don't think anybody really envisioned what ultimately became Prop 6. There was a lot of talk about uh, things that were unpopular, like a bottled water tax or uh, tap a, fee. a tap fee or an assessment on electric bills right. for different, you know, types of users to increase our our water uh, funding source, and that, that really didn't ever pan out. And so I have a lot of faith in the ingenuity and the, uh, the ability of, of the legislature and, and Texans generally to come up with reasonable solutions without just throwing money at a problem and hoping that it works. Right, money and may not be the only solution, but you acknowledge it, 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 it's, it's, it's part not of bad to have. It's actually part of... And, and part right. of our... our issue moving forward may be a discipline problem. We, you know, in good years when we have high sales tax receipts and the energy sector is, is booming and we have um, a surplus, we, we need to be disciplined on how we spend that money going forward because once it's allocated and appropriated, right. uh, you know, in subsequent sessions, if the economy is not so great, it makes it very difficult to pull back. And so I think that we have to exercise fiscal discipline moving forward. You don't think, Representative, that the people of this room or people elsewhere in the state could be sold by you people in the legislature on the importance of water as an issue going forward and persuaded that if we all just put in a little bit in the form of a tap fee or in the form of a bottled water tax or what have you, that we're basically contributing to the collective good? I think that's possible. You know, Benjamin Franklin, I think, said in a quote that we know the worth of water when the well runs dry. So if yeah. we were in a crisis stage, uh, we certainly would be able to communicate that and folks would understand it. And I think after the drought of 2011, the one thing that this, the, the state recognized statewide, really from east to west, north to south, was that everyone was affected. So in previous sessions and in previous terms where folks wanted to do something, you know, to find a sustainable water financing source and, and get that passed, it was difficult because, for instance, East Texas may be, you know, wet and full of water while West Texas was not. Or the groundwater folks may disagree with the surface water folks. And so right. there was a lot of disagreement. It's hard to get everybody on the same page. But the drought of 2011, the worst one-year drought we've ever faced, worst. certainly directed the attention uh, to the issue and that sort of... Uh, crisis coalesced all the forces and really got everyone on the same page. And so, yes, I think that's possible. Uh, it depends on the circumstances, but it certainly, uh, I think we came out with a more preferable solution. Senator Seliger, Chairman, I'm going to ask you about the same thing on transportation. We haven't raised the gas tax in how long? There's been discussion of the relatively low burden on automobile owners in this state relative to other states. I think Chair, we may be 44th Chairman out of 50, I think, and the burden on individual Texans who own cars compared to individuals in other states. We have a relatively low renewal of our driver's license fee. We have a relatively low registration of our car fee. I'll keep looking at Chairman Williams because we've had this conversation <laughs> before. Um, why could the people of Texas who hate to sit in traffic almost as much as anything not be persuaded that there are some revenue solutions to contribute to the problem? I mean, honestly, if we put $2 billion in toward a $53 billion water plan, that is, forgive the pun, a drop in the bucket. But if you put $2 billion in over a biennium, only a quarter of what TxDOT needs to maintain the roads, toward a $270 billion or more dollar problem on transportation, that really seems like almost nothing. 
So why not come to the people of the state and say, we need to figure out another source of revenue? The people can be convinced over time, and I think that is a process. And, and I think we had a very active discussion during the session under Chairman Williams' leadership about uh, an increase in the tax. A lot of people in West Texas feel that, that incrementally we will pay more in West Texas toward that than other people because the distance people drive Spend here. Spend so much more time in your cars. Yeah. Right. And, and, but they also feel in West Texas that they will not receive a proportionate amount of money coming back. back to West Texas. Right. There is a, a legitimate area for resistance. When right. we talk about registration fees and driver's license fees, I think if there is going to be any movement, I think it will probably be there. But it's going to be a, a, a matter of including the people in the state of Texas in that dialogue and having a productive one. D does the increasing uh, <clears throat> a, a place or role of toll roads in the conversation these days, con I mean, I know it's not a huge percentage of the number of road miles we have in Texas, but we're hearing a lot more around the state about tolling as one way at this. Not in West Texas. Not in West Along Texas. Along the I-35 corridor. But elsewhere. We'll see that. But remember the, the, the reaction and, and all of the, uh, the drama around a proposal in the I-35 corridor to have an increase in taxes locally yeah. by zip code, I guess, or area code for people essentially a user fee to increase right. the tax in that area for mobility projects in that, that area. area. Essentially a user fee that would affect people in this room right. almost not at all until we went to the Metroplex. And, and it ended up not getting a lot of mileage. It yep. cost someone a, a seat in the House of Representatives and, and was considered an un-American proposal. It could only be implemented in this program with a vote of the people. And so it was fundamentally a matter of local control and, and local election and things right. like that. But the people in that part of the state of Texas were having none of it. I think that you've given the Amarillo Globe a headline. Seliger says, increase in transportation revenue, un-American. I, <laughs> I think that's excellent. I won't pay a high price for that. I like that. No, you know, around these parts, you get more votes from uh, Chairman Smithy, let me move quickly from physical infrastructure to social infrastructure. We like to be first in everything in the state of Texas. Well, we happen to be first in the number of our citizens and the percentage of our citizens who don't have health insurance. Um, and we are first by a good distance over the next state uh, in, on, on the list. Um, it's a conservative state, politically. Uh, elections have consequences, peace. The conservative leaders of this state, including the three of you on the stage and the conservative leadership in the legislature said we shouldn't expand Medicaid. We shouldn't embrace key aspects of the Affordable Care Act. So we know what you're against. Tell us what you're for. Tell us how we solve what has been really a chronic problem not just a Rick Perry as governor problem, it was a problem when George Bush was governor, it was a problem when Ann Richards was governor, but the magnitude of the population has grown as the population has grown. So what do we do about that? Well, we've, you know, this is not a new problem. It's, it's been, we've had the, the highest rate of uninsured in Texas for probably three or four decades. Right. And, uh, you know, we've looked at every, every way you could possibly solve it if there is anything government can do. I'm talking about the private insurance market. Yes. And, uh, one of the things that, that I wanted to know is who are the un uninsured? I want to know who those people are. And so, you know, we, about four or five years ago, we, we had a, a select committee. There have been a number of those over the years. And we, we looked at who the uninsured are. And, and the, the, the thing that surprised me was that among uh, Anglo uh, population, among uh, 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 African Americans, we were pretty much where everybody else was in, in other states. We, we, we were well within the pack. Where we had our problem was, was uh, people of Hispanic origin. Now, okay, so we identify that's, that's where the, the impact is. And so we want to know why. You know, that's the next question is, is why are we lagging in, the, in that area? And, and there are a number of reasons. We, you know, there's some statistical reasons and some anecdotal reasons. But I think statistically what you look at is the types of employer. Most people get health insurance through their employers Employer, if they have right. private insurance. Uh, there is a high rate of Hispanic employment with employers who don't offer insurance. It's, you know, smaller employers, agricultural, right. rural. So that, that's, that's one reason. What part, our biggest part of our problem is a demographic problem. Uh, and and uh, there's very little that we can do by way of passing law to change that. Now, you did mention specifically the, the Medicaid. And, and you know, you, you mentioned, I think you phrased it, that we didn't want, want to do the Medicaid expansion. I, I don't know if it was so much not wanting to. Uh, from my standpoint, 
uh, and, and uh, colleague standpoint, as, as looking at the financial implications of the federal government basically saying, you know, we'll help you for a period of time, but after right. that you're on your own. And we look down the road and, and we don't see how, how the situation would be manageable for, for the state. Financially. Financially. Right. We, we just don't have the revenue to do that, and I don't know how we do raise the revenue to, 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 uh, to spend that much on, on, on Medicaid right. over a long period of time. Of course, Chairman, there's a cost to doing nothing. I mean, I know that the legislature doesn't want to do nothing. But the percentage, if I understand correctly, you're all smarter about this stuff than I am. As I understand correctly, the percentage of the unrestricted portion of the budget that is represented by health care is by far the fastest growing part of our budget. Public ed for a long time was the far and away largest percentage of the unrestricted portion of the budget. Health care is now close to being equal or equal and is fixing to race past it. So while I grant you that there was a piece of this associated with the feds are going to give you 100% of the, of the Medicaid costs for a period of time and then 90% eventually trickle off. At the end of the day, that's money being left on the table, and at the moment, we're not solving the problem, and at the moment, the costs are threatening to devour the entire budget. So help me understand how, how in the absence of an alternative, uh, uh, we're going to go forward. Or if there is an alternative on the table, tell us what it is. Well, I think you, know, you, you, you have two separate problems here. One is, is health care, and the other is insurance, OK? And, and we tend to mix those together okay. as one thing. Uh, I mean, to me, the, uh, the problem is systemic. You know, it, it, it's not an easy problem to fix. It's not, a, it's not one thing here or another thing here. It, it's systemic to the whole system of how health care is delivered, how health care is paid for in the United States. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think, I'm not sure that government can solve the problem because I think government basically caused the problem. I mean, you look back, and, and I think the three biggest factors that have, have served to cause a real issue here, I think by far the biggest is, is is the way Congress and legislatures, Congress implemented Medicare and state legislatures have implicated Medicaid by reimbursing at less than, yep. uh, than necessary levels. Well, what that is, is a very insidious and, uh, and I mean, a very uh, evil tax that is placed on people who do pay for their health care because they are being forced to pay uh, basically a tax uh, to fund these programs that, the, that Congress and the legislatures didn't have the courage to adequately fund right. or to raise taxes to do. And so that's, I think that's the big root problem is the cost shifting that goes on and, and, and the unrealistic expectations that are placed on people who actually pay for insurance. But you've got a lot of other things. You know, the whole idea of employer-based insurance is an interesting concept that dates back to the uh, price and wage controls back in World War II. But the, there, it's been a lot of good things. It's, it's encouraged enrollment. It's increased enrollment. But the, there's some bad things. One, the, the biggest thing, it, it is detached the ultimate consumer of the product from, from who provides the product. And so you don't have any market force. Well, you'd like it to be portable, but for some people, they have to stay in a job they don't want to remain in. That's the big thing. You become, you become a slave rather than an employee in, in yeah. many cases there. So uh, all of those things that the government has done, either directly right. or indirectly, I think has led to this problem. And it's systemic. I think you, you're going to have to, at some point, isolate what the problem is and, and try to, to make the delivery of health care much more efficient than what it is today. And you can do that. But we have. Uh, we have the best system in the world, and we have the worst system in the world. Ch Chairman, let me ask you about an aspect of this, Chairman Seliger. You know, the, the, I heard Chairman Smithy articulate what I would say is a commonly held position within yes. the legislature, both the House and the Senate. But, you know, at the county level, you have a lot of county judges who are out there fulminating for an expansion of Medicaid. And the reason is they see the uncompensated care costs rising, and they see that property taxes and other expenses associated with having to deal with the problem of the uninsured being passed on to people back home. And they say, look, you know, we really can't afford not to look seriously at this. So there's, again, a fundamental tension, state and local. What do we do about that? I don't think <clears throat> that people object, let's say, to this side of the room, all underemployed or unemployed with yeah. no insurance. Nobody wants them to go without health care. Yeah. It, it's, it's how you do it that matters. The question is, uh, who pays for it? Right. And the truth is, it's going to be business and people with jobs who are going to pay for it. And that's why the current system in place, I think, is a real job killer. The answer, I think, and it may be a stopgap effort, that instead of the current provisions of the Affordable Care Act, yeah. federal block grants, money that's going to come to the state anyway uh, to pay for Medicaid, going to the states, let the states develop the exchanges and, 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 and the mechanism by which that is paid for. 
Here's the harsh reality. If you take all these people without jobs and provide them insurance, and you take the 10% increase a year on health care costs, there is no real answer except it costs a continue increase in an increment that's unaffordable. Right. And that's what we have to deal so with. You, so you are in the camp, Chairman, that you'd like to see the government drop an enormous cartoon bag of money with a dollar <laughs> sign on it on our doorsteps. At this, at this moment, they're dropping that bag of money with a whole lot of strings attached. You want and, no strings. Well, a whole lot fewer strings, right. but as, as Commissioner Sees pointed out at the time, that under the current provisions of the Affordable Care Act for the 10-year period 2014 to 2024, that it was going to increase state costs by $27 billion over the next 10 years. Yep. As creative as he was, Chairman Williams couldn't tell us where that money was going to come from. Yeah. Connor. I think it's responsible to look at it long term because as the cost of health care consumes more and more of our budget, that restricts what we can spend on other areas on like other transportation. Right. Oh, yeah. And one thing you asked what we can do, and, and, and I, I certainly think that we look at the, at, at the history of this and, and moving forward, doctors in Texas, you know, 14 years ago in the year 2000, I think 67% accepted new Medicaid patients. Well, now that number is down to about 30, 31 percent. And so as the number of enrollees is increasing, the number of actual providers is decreasing. This gets to Chairman Smith. And it, it follows up on, on what he was mentioning there. So I think we've got to look at our, our infrastructure for right. indigent care. We right. look at, you know, maybe some non-traditional incentives for after-hours care, things that will allow folks who typically would go to the ER not to put such a high demand on the emergency room services that are being there because those are so expensive. And so I think we have to look overall, but if we don't maintain that discipline that I was referring to earlier, if we don't look at it long term, we will see that cost consume so much of our budget that it's, it's the tail wagging the dog. Well, to the point that uh, Chairman Seligman, to the point that Representative Price is making about how this is a trade-off, spend money on something, don't spend money on something else. You have chaired the Committee on Higher Education in the Senate. Mm -hmm. You understand the challenges that not just higher ed, but also public ed face. It seems as if people believe there's never enough money. We can stipulate that money is not the only answer. On the public ed side, there was a significant decrease in funding in the eyes of some. Some characterize it differently. In the 2011 session to public ed, you all came back and then put $3.5 billion, more or less, back into public education in the last session. Fast-growing state. A lot of those people coming to the state have kids, put them in our public schools, resources strained in public ed. On the higher ed side, the state's share of funding of higher ed has steadily decreased to the point that some people wonder if we're going to be out of compliance with the constitutional provision that we provide a university of the first class. Um, some people wonder if you get down to 12%, 10%, 8% of funding of higher ed, are you in violation of the word provide? So there's always a tension with money and public ed, money and higher ed. What do we do about that? I think university, the first class people normally refer to the University of Texas and Texas A&M as those flagship universities. As we sit here today at West Texas A&M, it goes a lot deeper than that and yeah. effectively there. Yeah. Uh, we're seeing some things going on today that I think affect that. And we talk about things like early college high school, which is a partnership between independent school districts and community colleges where young people start taking college courses very early on. They graduate with a high school diploma an associate's degree from a community college at generally no additional expense to the young person. All they need now is two more years of college to get a degree. Right. Distance learning and the virtual classroom are having a huge impact there. And they're bringing uh, costs down. Oh, unquestionably, they're bringing costs down. Lots of universities are going in with fixed tuition plans as well as the 10 year degree, which is being implemented in places right here today. And so there are a lot of approaches to that, but once again, higher education is the same boat with, with every other spending priority. Yeah. Once you do 40% for public education, 30% for health care, you've got 30% left for everything, everything else. else. Um, and and it, when we talk about the, the, the constitutional involvement there and commitment, it's not the same as that that's talked about in the Constitution for Public Schools, and I really don't think we're going to see Chancellor Sharp sue the state of Texas for funding. As the, as the certain number, 600 school districts have done. And Chairman Smithy, that lawsuit on public education is now working its way through the appellate process. The initial ruling by Judge Dietz in Austin 
uh, and people who don't like his ruling make certain to say that he's an Austin judge who, who, <laughs> yeah. who ruled it, uh, was that the state may be underfunding public education to the tune of $2,000 per enrolled student, which would be a $10 billion hit annually or a $20 billion hit over a biennium. Now, the Supreme Court could come back and the calculation could be different and who knows what's going to happen. But you know, we have at least one superintendent here today. I think that for a lot of superintendents, the fast growth of the state, the challenges that we face in public education, the demands of parents and of kids and of community uh, leaders, I think they want to know what we're going to do to adequately fund uh, public ed. So ease everybody's mind today. Well, <laughs> uh, you know, one thing about it is, is it's hard, hard to, it, it's counter to the argument when you see some school districts building $60 million football stadiums. Uh, to come back and say there's not enough money in, in public ed. You're, you're not against football. No, not against football <laughs> at all. You can't. That be would be in the un American <laughs> headline probably. Along That's abso time. absolutely right. Yeah, clear yes, that up. Sure. But yeah, right. I can tell you we don't have any $60 million football stadiums in this area. Yeah. And even at West Texas here, yeah. we have a very nice stadium, but it's not like that. But uh, the, the uh, part of the problem right now is how the money's being distributed, obviously, the, the equity issue. And... Um, one of the, th you know, I, I'm a fan of the lawsuit because uh, you're a fan of the lawsuit. I'm, the, I'm a fan of the lawsuit because I don't think you'll ever find a, a political solution with, within the halls of the legislature. Because the, for instance, our problem up here is, is the formula that's in place now. I, I think to a large extent discriminates against rural school districts, but it also discriminates against uh, slow, slower growth districts. It really benefits the faster growth suburban type districts. That's where the votes are in the legislature. And so Four and I, when we're in the House, we don't have, and Kel in the Senate, we don't have the votes to win that fight. And so you're never going to get a truly equitable system, I don't think, out of the legislature. I think you're going to have to have judicial intervention at some point. Now, just because it come out, comes out of the court doesn't necessarily mean it'll be fair or right, but I think you have a better shot right. at getting there. Uh, through the judicial system through right. the, and then through the political system. And Representative system. Price, what S uh, Chairman Smithy is talking about also provides you all with political cover. You know, there are a lot of people who believe that the legislature votes for political reasons one way on funding public education, but every individual member secretly says to himself or herself, oh God, I hope the courts make me do the right thing <laughs> so that I can say to the voters, I had a gun in my head. But you know, that, so the, the tension between what is politically palatable and what is substantively right. Do, do you want the courts, as, as Chairman Smithy does, to come in and tell you to do something? I, I agree with him because, uh, quite frankly, you know, every 10 years for the last 40 years, there's been a lawsuit over public education It's like seeing funding. the same movie over right. and over. That's and, right. and so if history is telling us anything, it's very difficult to, to pass an equitable system for the long term that will, you know, change as the state changes. And as we've seen the state change and school districts bloom all over the state right. and you know kids enrolled at, at record numbers I think we have somewhere around five million public education students in Texas today so you know uh, to, to think that politically uh, that that would be achieved in, in the legislature is is, uh, is tough it's a hard deal it's a hard deal and I think that the uh, the the first thing folks do when they see how a proposal will affect them is they look at their own school districts, the school districts that they represent. Yeah. And they see, you know, how a change here or there or a word here or there in the bill might affect their districts. And, and you know, because we have such disparity in our districts and uh, the way they're funded and the way they look and the size of the districts, I mean, it's, it's really hard to think that you would have a, a fair political solution. So I agree with Chairman Smithy. I think that, uh, yes, it, it provides some, some, you know, I guess direction and cover as you put it, but it also uh, may have a chance of being more equitable. All right, we're going to uh, have one uh, more round of questions up here, and I'd encourage people, if you have questions, to think about lining up behind the microphone so we can move into a Q&A portion with the audience. I want to ask about immigration. We, we started off by talking about, early on, the, the fast growth of the state. What we know, Chairman, is that much of that growth is in the Latino community. We are soon going to be a Latino majority state. The conversation about immigration in this campaign cycle has been, let's say, interesting. Uh, in fact, there are a couple stories in the papers today, including one that the Tribune had in the New York Times about the four candidates for lieutenant governor and some of the rhetoric that has come up in the course of that race in which I think it can be fairly said everybody is trying to get to the right of everybody else. Um, 
this presents a, a, a substantive problem for, for the state because we're sort of the epicenter of the epicenter. What happens in Texas will be modeled, will be watched and modeled for what happens elsewhere in the country. But for your party, and I have three Republicans up here, it is also a political challenge. Um, you know what happened in the last presidential election. Mitt Romney got the second lowest percentage of the Hispanic vote of any presidential candidate running as a Republican in the last 40 years. Um, and there are a lot of people who say, including some prominent Republican Hispanics, that the rhetoric in the party on immigration has gotten to the point where they may vote for Senator Letitia Vandepute, the Democrat, in the fall. Could each of you address where should we be on the immigration issue and what should the conversation around this issue be to ensure that you're not running Hispanics out of the Republican Party? Well, you know, you've got two distinct issues. I mean, you know, you've got the border issue and you've got the, the immigration issue. You, you are, see them as distinct. I think they're distinct issues. The, 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 the sad fact is in Texas, we have very little control over our own border. You know, some of the candidates have talked about putting uh, troops on the border, you know, DPS uh, troops and so forth. Uh, our problem down there on the border is, is what we do if we, if we catch somebody, because we don't really have any, anything to do with them. We don't have any, any place to put them. We, don't, we have to basically turn them over to the federal government, and, uh, and we, lose, we lose control. It's, it's almost, that, that's almost counterproductive to, to spend funds on that. I think where we've spent funds effectively over the last six or eight years has been on some of the interdiction uh, areas of drugs and gangs, uh, and, and much of that's occurred off the border. It's occurred in places like the Panhandle. Uh, you know, with I-40, we have a tr uh, we have a lot of traffic that goes through here as far as drugs and other things that shouldn't be going through. But I think that that we're, from a Republican standpoint, uh, I mean, we we've got to stay the party of opportunity. We, we just have to because that's that's the only that's the last best hope for Texas. It's the last best hope for America. Uh, I think uh, the, I think the Hispanic voters that, that we talk to, and all of us have a, a significant Hispanic population, and it's hard to just put them into just one demographic group and say Hispanics believe this or Hispanics right. think that. They're, they're all, di all different, just like anybody else. But most of the, of the Hispanic voters that, that I talk to up here, uh, what they really want is opportunity for their families. You know, they, they really want... They're not, many are not happy where they are right now. They want to do better. They so want to, you think it's an economic argument as much as anything? I think the economic argument is a winner if it can be articulated yeah. uh, in, a, in a manner that's understandable. Are you and, hearing much, and, Chairman, in the debate in this campaign cycle about economic opportunity? Because it sounds like the conversation is actually all about border security and sending people back home and, and, and this, that, and the other. And those are things that, that we really don't have all that much control over. Yeah. Now, I think one of the things that's kind of exciting is if you look you know, at the, at the, uh, uh, at, at the uh, production, I mentioned a moment ago the oil and gas production that's going on yep. uh, in, in South Texas, you know, that extends over into Mexico. There's, there's a real area in, into Mexico that, that could be uh, produced as well, and the partnerships that could be not, uh, you know, it, you, I think the, the, the more partnerships that we can forge with, with, with more, uh, Mexico and the interest in Mexico, uh, to have to have the, this this uh, cooperation and this uh, ongoing these jo joint efforts, I think will benefit both Texas and Mexico. Yeah. Uh, you know, people come here because they don't they want a job. Right. Uh, but there's no reason that jobs can't be created in Mexico. They should be created in Mexico, and and they should be created in Texas as well. I mean, it's going to benefit everybody. Uh, it, it never helps either one of us if we're we're at war. If Texas is at war with Mexico, we're we're neighbors. We're partners. Right. And we should be partners. Representative Price, uh, I, I, whatever, I, who could argue with what Chairman Smithy just said? Uh, no. <laughs> his, his, his approach to discussing this, however, is a contrast from what we're hearing. I heard a Republican Hispanic commentator on television say with regard to this issue, you can't tell us we're ugly all year long and then expect that we'll go to the prom with you. <laughs> um, for some Hispanics in the state, the rhetoric of this campaign has been effectively telling them that they're ugly all year long. And then come election time, you want them to go to the prom with you. So how do you, how do you square the economic argument that Chairman Smithy is making with discussions of invasions and, and what have you that we've heard over the last couple of, of weeks in the campaign? Well, that's a real challenge. I don't think uh, always that the party has done the greatest job or members of the party have done the greatest job explaining themselves or making that message very clear because we are the party of opportunity and we need to be more inclusive, not exclusive. And, and so sometimes there are folks who 
who, uh, you know, instead of seeking solutions and being pragmatic and realistic about where we are and where we need to be, uh, the rhetoric gets, uh, you know, out of control, and that's not productive for anybody. So, frankly, I, I think the economic argument's a good one. I think the basic principles of, uh, of the Republican Party are attractive to Hispanics and Hispanic families in the state of Texas. But I also believe that, um, you know, they're distinct issues. Uh, legal and illegal immigration, of course, are distinct. And the immigration issue and our border security, yep. those are distinct. And, and we have spent $300 million a biennium, I believe, on our border security. And so we, we, we do value the importance of securing our border and making it safe. I think that's very important. We don't want illegal human trafficking and drug trafficking and gang violence bleeding over not only on our border cities, but further into the state. But, you know, that, that often gets wrapped around the illegal immigration, you know, dispute or discussion. Well, part of, part of the reason, Representative, that it gets wrapped around it is it's a bit of a dog whistle ideologically, is it not? I mean, there are signs being very clearly sent to certain people who might turn out in a primary where the number of voters is so small that every vote counts. So a lot of the conversation I mentioned is, is taking place in the lieutenant governor's race. Have you endorsed in that race? I have not. Have you endorsed in that not, race, not Chairman? Formally, no. Have you endorsed? You know these guys. You, you work for one of them and the person of Lieutenant Governor Dewhurst. Members of the Senate do not work for the Lieutenant Governor. Well, he's the presiding <laughs> officer. I mean, you work for the people of this peace. You work for the people of the state, but surely you know what I mean. He is in a different branch of government. He's in a different branch of government. Oh, really? Okay. Let me let me rephrase. That being let said, me rephrase. No. You occasionally see him in the washroom. How about that? In the <laughs> Okay. Okay. <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll accept that one. Who are you endorsing in the race? I have not endorsed you anyone. You will not endorse. Do you think there's a problem here that you guys have, you Republicans have to work on? Rhetoric versus substance? Truly exemplary leadership is always a challenge. Yeah. The kind of people who have both the sort of vision that's good for the state and, and, and all of its people and the pathway to get there. So yeah, yeah it's always a challenge. Um, is, is you look at the debates that we've seen and the stances that they have taken present and future, not a dime's bit of difference in any of them. Right. Not I mean, the, re the reality is th this, this race and many of the other primaries, this is going to be decided, like they say in the BCS, on style points, right? Yeah, it'll be style the points. The difference between these guys is negligible on a lot of and including on this issue. Yeah. Right. Uh, no, I haven't endorsed anybody. I've got a race to run, and I really can't concern myself with anyone else's race. It's and, a very politic answer, sir. Well, <laughs> it's, it's absolutely true. I think that, that there are people among those that, that I think will do a really good job. Yeah. Um, and, and how will we work with them, both as an individual senator and as a body? Who is, at the end of the day, what we're looking for is who is going to strengthen the Senate yeah. and make us more effective and, and more cohesive. Right. Okay. Well, let, let's leave that there. Let's, because uh, we, 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 we could go on and on with this, I promise you. Uh, anybody want to come in and ask questions? We've got uh, room at the microphone. I want to encourage you to do that, and we'll take as many questions as time permits. And if I unfortunately have to cut people off, at, uh, at a certain point, we'll, we'll do that apologetically, but we'll do it firmly. Sir, always good to be the first. All right. Go ahead. Uh, I've got a question on uh, health care. We as a nation, our health care cost is about 17% of GDP. Other industrial countries who are a democracy could vote it out if they wanted to, Theirs is costing around 10 to 12 percent. Now, two questions. One, why is there a difference of that much? And also, is greed a problem? <laughs> Chairman? Oh. Well, I, I would have two, competitive, two answers for that. I mean, I think there are probably more, but I, two things that come to mind. One is that in this country we place an extra, a higher value than most other countries do on the in, end of life, uh, that, and we spend a considerable amount of resources uh, at the end of people's lives. Uh, Percentage-wise, it's, it's a very large percent. I, I don't have a problem with that because I, I think the quality of life and end of life, prolonging life, is, is, a, legitimate, is a legitimate goal. 
So that, that's one difference. That's one, one reason that, that we spend more in the United States is because of how we value not only end of life, but beginning of life. We, we spend more money on babies at the, at the beginning than most other countries. The other thing that I think is important is, is the lack of competitive forces within our system, uh, the marketplace. Uh, as I said, the things that government has done over the last 60 years have basically removed the basic concept of a, a marketplace uh, guard and protection uh, on the cost and the delivery of, and the quality of medical services, which I think has been counterproductive. So those are the two that I would point to. So any, any place that the, that the marketplace can get more into this and create more competition? I think it would be a benefit. You think that would be a benefit and possibly drive cost? Yeah, and I think all you have to do is look at things like cell phones and, uh, and TV sets. You know, uh, any kind of, of cons where consumers make decisions, history indicates that, that consumer choice and a marketplace environment will, will be a good, will have a good impact on, on, on not only price, but also quality of service. Okay. Ma'am. Um, my name is Claudia Stravato, and, and fortunately or unfortunately, I know everybody up there uh, too well. <laughs> and, and, your um, son, and your son is a photographer for the Texas Tribune. And the New York Times. And the New York Times. Yeah. <laughs> I, I put the Tribune first, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's my event, Claudia. Yeah. Uh, uh, go, go ahead. He's he's always. Do y'all want to go have lunch together? <laughs> <laughs> he's always embarrassed when people. Uh, John Whitmire looked at him one day a long time ago and said, "Don't tell me that she's your mother." And uh, I want to talk about the human side of resources. Uh, I, I I was hearing that that human needs are being equated equally with uh, roads and infrastructure. And maybe it's because I'm a woman that I think maybe human needs should be priority. And from a moral part of, point of view, I also think that. Um, but I'd like to comment on the problem with uh, Texas ranking, it's either first or 50th, however you phrase it, that over 50% of all of our people over 25 do not have a high school education. Okay. And that, uh, you know, you're talking about growth of jobs. And in fact, uh, uh, Representative Price was just here two nights ago in the snow talking to my honors class, and we talked about this a little bit. Um, how can uh, we say that we have the most wonderful jobs and people want to come here when we have one of the lowest per capita income ratings in the United States, and most of the jobs that are being brought in are low income, and the rate we're going, we will not be able to fill any highly skilled positions. Right now, if you talk with the Texas Medical Association, they're bringing in more foreign doctors than we're creating in this state. Uh, we're having to get the uh, visas for what's called the geniuses, uh, you know, to come in from other countries to fill a lot of our IT requirements. We're going backwards. We're not going forward when it comes to education. And then you, and then just one last thing. And so then you have him, I always don't like to say his name, then you have him cutting everybody enormously in 2011, <laughs> that's the governor. Okay, okay. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> and you, so you, you've got population going you this mean way. Him. Uh, <laughs> you've got population going this way what? and you've got the budgets going okay, that Claudia, way, you let's, can't let's, ever catch up. Let's ask Chairman, in deference to the people behind you and to the folks up here, let's ask Chairman Tilligan to address that. You know, this is a good, it's a good question in here. You know, we are prosperous, we've gotten to be more successful over time, but what Mr. Travato says is true. We may have created more jobs in the last 13 plus years than any other state, but we're now tied with Mississippi for the most minimum wage jobs, right? I mean, there are some questions as to whether the, sh the sort of shine on all of this when you look underneath it mm -hmm. is as it, is, it appears. We're so creating a lot of high quality and high income jobs as well, but yeah. we must have jobs for people wherever on the socioeconomic spectrum they lie. Right. And some of them are, are not real high paying jobs, yeah. but those are still people who need those jobs. Yeah. Uh, when you, you talk about health care and things like that, we've created uh, two brand new four-year medical schools, one in Austin and one down in the Valley. Valley. Right. And so we're getting there, but it's never going to be an instantaneous response or solution. As we see the trends develops, we have to resp res respond to it, and I think in large part we do. Is it ever going to be where we're exactly where we need to be? Probably not. Uh, are we going to compete in some of those areas with smaller states like Minnesota and Wisconsin where border issues and things like that don't really matter, where the populace is largely homogenous? 
in some areas, we won't necessarily catch up to them. Representative Price, what Mr. Votto says about the public education system having a problem graduating an adequate number of people, we know this to be true. We know that on the higher ed side, Chairman Seliger, the four-year graduation rate, soon that will be an obsolete metric, but the four-year graduation rate at most of our public universities is below 50 percent. What do we do about that? Is, is that the underside to, the, to this great story that we tell of Texas? Well, time's going to tell a little bit based on what we did this past session with House Bill 5. I right. think that was a good step in the right direction. I know locally and statewide, there was a lot of concern with high school students dropping out between their freshman and sophomore year. Yeah. They would take a series of end of course exams, star tests. If they didn't pass them, then the next year they had to take not only was what was required that year, but what they failed the year before. And pretty soon all hope was lost if they didn't see light yeah. at the end of the tunnel. Um, that's changed, and certainly with multiple pathways now to graduation and uh, an emphasis on keeping kids in school and allowing them to pursue a STEM endorsement on one end or vocational training over here or something that focuses on fine arts and humanities. I mean, having a variety and having different paths may keep those kids in school. I think we'll see improvement in, in keeping them in high school, and those that don't plan to go to college, if they are able to obtain a skill in high school and start working and start paying taxes, uh, they will fill a niche in the job market that we, we all desperately need. And, and do well, you know, Chairman. And do very well. A lot of the people who are going to work in this uh, oil boom yeah. are making more money the first year out of college than people who are getting fancy schmancy degrees. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. People so are going to work for McDonald's in Midland in Odessa and making more money. At the there. moment, that's right, <laughs> yeah. Ma'am. My name is Jim Perkins, and uh, as Claudia said, I think the three gentlemen on the stage are all familiar with me. I have a, a, a problem with the education funding, and, and the reason for that is if we have trouble funding education, why is the legislature so dead set on funding through voucher systems, private and parochial schools, and also funding charter schools? Uh, and the charter schools argument that the vocational programs uh, would, would be, that, that it helps the vocational people, doesn't hold water because when I was high school principal in Tulia, yeah. we had an area vocational school. And some of the area schools that, that participated in our program helped pay for it, but also we got funding from the state. So doesn't it make more sense? Well, the fact, I, I think, well, the fact I think is we're I, mandated for a public education. I, I think the fact private. is, uh, Ch Chairman, the legislature actually overwhelmingly rejected vouchers this yeah, session, right? You know, the only real vote in the House that I know of was on the appropriation, as a right of the appropriations yeah. vote. It was, it was, Support wasn't there. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. So, yeah. but, the char but the charter, what, what, what Mr. Perkins, the, the, char yeah. the charter piece of this is, I think, what was we refer to as the expansion, not unlimited, but the expansion of the number of charter schools uh, that would be available as part of an expanded parental choice option. So if your kid's in a failing school, you have the, a greater ability to move your kid to a school that might work, it might be a public school, and there would be in places that can accommodate them more charter schools. Uh, Chairman, anything wrong with that? I don't think so. Charter schools are public schools in the state of Texas. Yeah. They don't operate the same as all the rest of the public schools. But they have but, adequate accountability, as far as you're concerned? Uh, it's developing, and I think we made some real progress this next time on getting rid of the ones that don't. They have to take the tests and things like that, as they should. It's, we're making some progress there. But people ought to have some choices. And I think charter schools very often provide that choice. They're still under the state educational system, as they should be. Uh, we didn't expand the, the number of charters as much or as quickly as a lot of people wanted to see to it that our systems are in order so that the only charter schools that we have are truly good ones. And, um, and like I say, I think we're making progress there. When it comes to voucher systems, they've largely been rejected because no one has yet found out how we're going to subtract that money from the foundation school program and still have the system that we're going to be required to, I think, that the courts insist upon and we should insist upon going forward in public schools. And the other thing nobody ever talks about in that context is accountability. And there can't be the expenditure of taxpayers' money without accountability. So those dollars would migrate out of the public system into the private or parochial system, but not have the accountability measures follow them. That's the only suggestion that I've seen so far, and, and I think that's untenable. What about the voucher system? Sir? 
What about the Well, I think that's exactly what he's talking about, vouchers. There is no voucher system. There is no voucher system. Is no voucher system. <laughs> Ma'am. Hi, my name is Sharon Stones. Um, a neighbor to a few of you. Um, some of you, um, your children have gone to school with my children who... Um, right, so you better give a good answer. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> which means yeah. I owe you an apology, <laughs> and I'm sorry. Because she knows where you live. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, go ahead. And first Question. of all, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and for the hard work that you do every day. Okay. I mean, it's, uh, it's a tough job um, to get up and... Um, you know, represent your state. I'm more concerned since I'm not a native Texan. I was born in New York State, was in one of the best public school systems in Westchester County, um, moved to Florida where there's no income tax, went to high school there, and uh, have worked in Washington, D.C. Children were born there. So anyway, I've, Texas isn't the only place I've ever lived. Yeah. Um, anyway, and I'm glad we have this opportunity because I've been looking for opportunities to, you know, maybe ask you a few questions. Um, and what I, you've talked a lot generally just about the state and a little bit about federal things, but what I've seen, and I've only recently become more politically um, interested or active, you know, a lot of us are very passive. Um, about what's going on locally and what you have decided at the state level and voted on and how that really represents and affects the majority of the population living here in Amarillo. I um, can speak just from a medical standpoint, since my husband and I are both in that profession, that uh, we have invited representatives to come to our office and spend the day with us. Take off your suit, don't wear anything, Probably some people wouldn't recognize who don't you are. Don't wear anything? Who you are. <laughs> well, wear anything. That I didn't say no wear nothing. <laughs> let, let me, let me, let me respect, respectfully ask that you ask your question just in deference to the people behind you. I'm sorry. Right. Okay. Yeah. And so um, I'm concerned about how in touch you are with the people that aren't attending your political fundraising events and, um, you know, are just representative of different neighborhoods. I've done Meals on Wheels here and have gone into neighborhoods that... I would otherwise not have traveled into. I didn't have a reason. It's a real eye-opener. Um, mental health. I, I've had an incredible six-hour experience today since I've woke up between. Um, right now, I'm giving free housing to a person who has a PhD in biochemistry who lost her job in August with Texas A&M and AgriLife uh, because of the sequestration. Um, she is 48 years old, single, um, has, you know, is on unemployment. Is I need to ask you to ask a question. Okay. I'm so sorry. So, Please. anyway, um, <laughs> the question is, what, what are you doing that's helping your population here in Amarillo that aren't in the top, you know, income areas? And... You know, I'd like to invite you to spend a day without suits on in Tascosa High School. You know, go into different class. I've done that as a parent. People can I, let, me, let me can I address this? Chairman Selger, what, what, what Because you, what I've been to high tech, uh, Tascosa High School, and I've been to Booker High School in Perryton and Borker. Oh, I know you 30, visited them. Yeah. I have 37 town hall meetings. This year we're doing 39. Right. For explanation later. And, and publicizing them and asking people to come and talk about those issues. Mm -hmm. This is a town of 194,000, our last town hall meeting, got about 40, 40 people. I all know. three of us go all over the city where we're asked to come and answer questions, but for the life of me, I don't recall seeing you at one of my town hall meetings. No, and I'm not asking you to do that. I just, do you really understand um, what it's like to be a let me, child. Let me ask, let me ask any there. of you who wants to address this to do okay. it. We're going to only now have time for one more question. I want to well, be sure we get okay. to it. Well, one of the, I mean, I think one of the things about the, the, the system that the framers of our Constitution in Texas put in place is we all live in the community. I mean, right. you know, a lot of times it's you're a citizen a, legislature. It's a citizen legislature. I mean, we go to the grocery store, we go to the barber shop, we go to the, uh, our kids are in public, all three of us have, ki have had kids in public school. I mean, we, I think, have a pretty good feel for where people are, and it's, uh, you always have surprises when you find out that somebody is in a plight that you didn't know about. Uh, we, we're always learning about those things, but I don't think any of us don't care about 
people we represent. I mean, that's, that's why, why we do this. That's what we're doing is trying to represent people uh, at, all, at all, all different, a very diverse population that we have for all of us. Gentlemen, right there, please, your last okay. question. And I'm sorry we didn't get to your question, sir. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Senator Representatives, for coming here today. Related to the last question, I'm glad to hear that you expressed concern about the diversity of the citizens of Texas. My name is Jamie Farron. I'm president of a local nonprofit that represents atheists and other skeptics. I'm also a member of the WT chapter of the Secular Student Alliance. And what I'd like uh, from you three today, since you're here, is to know what you're doing or what you plan on doing to say to the, the growing segment of uh, the population in Texas, atheists and other skeptics who don't have religious faith, what you'd like to say to them to welcome them to the community. Because I speak to people every week who feel completely ostracized for their lack of religious belief. Let, let me take the faith. question and maybe give it a little bit of shape. Appreciate it. Sure. So that you all get to, you know, a lot of discussion about the proper place for faith in politics. A lot of people think that sometimes faith plays too large a role. There are some people who think faith doesn't play a large enough role. What is the right calibration between faith and politics in Texas today? Let each of you answer, and then we can, we can uh, let people get back to their day. <laughs> Sir. Personally, faith plays a large part in how I make my decisions, but I believe that there is a proper balance between the services the state is offering and those who are receiving them. And so if you're asking, you know, uh, can we make everybody feel welcome all the time, I don't think that's realistic, you know, but, but certainly uh, from a state's perspective, from the services that are being provided, uh, you know, the Constitution protects anybody's beliefs, whatever they are. And so, you know, whether you are receiving them or not receiving them, taking advantage of a, an opportunity, certainly that shouldn't uh, be prohibitive to you. But I, I believe that uh, everybody's entitled to their own uh, faith system, their own belief. And, uh, you know, from a state standpoint, uh, we certainly, uh, you know, we say a prayer every day on the House floor when we start. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's rare that, that I feel like somebody's being discriminated because of their beliefs uh, in, in, in a, whatever religion they're practicing. Chairman. I think, you know, you ha absolutely have the freedom to believe whatever you want to believe. But, you know, the, you've, you've got to look at the other side, too. A lot of my Christian friends feel like they're being discriminated against now because it seems like the Christian belief and, and the, the principles that really were the foundation of this country are being removed from, from our daily lives. And so... Uh, you know, it's not just atheists that may feel threatened. I think, I think people of faith are feeling threatened as well. And so the, the framers of the United States Constitution probably had the best idea yet of, of for there not to be a state religion, but also for people to be able to practice their faith uh, in the way, reasonable way that they deem to do that. And, and that we respect each other's beliefs, uh, but we, we don't interfere with each other's beliefs. Chairman, last word. You. To me, faith is a, is a deeply and intensely personal sort of thing. The one thing that you can be guaranteed of, I think, is the right to practice your religion type, lack of, however you want to and, and whenever you want to. And I think that's a fundamental principle. But for you and I who are in religious minorities, that is not going to change. And we will see broad-based expressions of sentiment based upon the beliefs of, of the majority. The question is, is if that becomes either insensitive or discriminatory, that's where there's a problem. And, and I think we don't see that terribly often. The fact that you, you you've detect in some communities a negative response to your practice, I think it's, it's probably a fact, but a lot of people feel that way. So would you three... Uh would you three support doing a rotating proclamation on the House floor instead of a prayer every time? Maybe do secular humanist proclamation. Maybe someone completely non-religious, and then a Buddhist, and then a Christian, and then a Muslim, and rotate that out so that everyone gets a little bit of a voice there? It, it's fine in the Senate. There are 30 Christians, and, and I think that, that will be sort of slow to evolve. <laughs> All right. Let's, uh, let, let's leave the conversation there. We appreciate so much your questions. Sorry we couldn't get to all of them. We especially appreciate these three making time to be here today with all of us to talk about these big issues. Can we please give John Smithy, Kel Seliger, and Floor Price a hand? Thank you again to West Texas A&M, Mr. President, to our sponsors. Thank you and to all of you for coming. We'll see you back up here again soon. Thanks very much.